All right, guys, tonight is our last lecture um, on states of consciousness. And what we're going to look at tonight is the effects of different drugs and how those drugs can alter consciousness. So we're going to have two lectures tonight, two recorded lectures. Um, the first is going to be on abused drugs and the effects that they have. And the second lecture is going to be sort of a little bit more of the neuroscience of how drugs actually affect neuronal transmission. So let's start. So the first class of drugs that we're going to look at are narcotics. And narcotics are sometimes referred to opiates. They're drugs that are derived from the opium plant that are usually used to relieve pain. The strongest of these opiates are heroin and morphine. Less potent opiates include drugs that are prescribed as pain medications like codeine and Demerol. Um, Vicodin is another one, Oxycontin. You've heard a lot of some of the drug companies um, just got sued and they had to pay a lot of money because they were just basically shipping out millions of these pills when they weren't really needed. Um, but yeah, that's really the opiates and, you know, they're used to, you know, medically relieve pain, but they're also a very strong way to get high, if you will. So the most significant narcotic problem in sort of modern Western society today involves the use of the opiates. And historically, you know, the one that was abused the most often was heroin, but that changed with the sort of um, easy access to the opiate prescription drugs, like I said, like Oxycontin. When it comes to heroin, it can be smoked, um, it can be sniffed, but most people that are addicted to heroin tend to inject it intravenous, intravenously with a hypodermic needle. So the question is, what are the effects of these narcotics? Um, usually the main desired effect of heroin is it gives you an overwhelming sense of euphoria that sort of has this who cares quality to it. Other effects that people use narcotics for, especially heroin and you know the prescription painkillers like Oxycontin, are it helps people relax, it helps people reduce anxiety, and it does help people that are in chronic pain. So those are the most often desired effects that people use and abuse narcotics for. Problem is with the narcotics compared to the other class of drugs that we're going to talk about, they have a high risk of not only psychological dependence, but the danger is in their addictive physical dependence. They're one of the most addicting drugs that can be abused. Another issue with the opiates is overdose. Um, if you look at 41% of drug-related deaths, they've been attributed to the narcotics. And other narcotics are present in about 22% of drug-related deaths. So when you take that together, that's a lot of deaths that are attributable to the narcotics compared to the other types of drugs like alcohol or sedatives or cannabis. So once heroin dependence is sort of entrenched, people tend to develop a drug-centered lifestyle that usually revolves around the need to procure more heroin and, you know, through undependent black market channels, you know, on the street. The high cost of heroin forces many heroin addicts to resort to criminal activities to support the habit. Now, that's changed a little bit because um, the issue was getting the pain pills, but because of the addictive quality of the pain pills, the price of heroin went down a lot because more people were using the narcotics. But then when the doctors would start prescribing the narcotics, they found that they could get heroin whenever they wanted to, and they could get it cheap. The other issue historically um, is because a lot of times heroin addicts share unsterilized needles, heroin Users also risk contraction of infectious diseases, including AIDS. In the United States, about one-third of AIDS cases have occurred among intravenous drug users who are mostly heroin addicts. Okay, now we'll take a look at another class of drugs, the sedatives. So the sedatives are usually legally prescribed and are used to help induce sleep and basically slow down central nervous system activity and behavioral activity. And over the years, the most widely abused sedatives have been the barbiturates, like quaaludes, historically, not so much anymore, but Valium and some of the other um, benzodiazepine drugs. 
people that abuse sedatives usually take them orally and generally, and here's where the danger comes in, usually consume larger doses than are prescribed for medical purposes. So sedatives can produce this, again, euphoric effect similar to that produced by drinking large amounts of alcohol, but they're also used because they can make you feel relaxed, they can reduce anxiety, and they have a tendency to loosen a person's inhibitions. Sedatives also have the potential to pr produce both psychological dependence and physical dependence. Another problem with sedatives, um, the overdoses are especially dangerous when people combine the drugs like Valium with alcohol. That really increases the potency of the drug and it makes um, the possibility of ODing much more real. Another issue is with prolonged use, the dose of the barbiturates that the body can handle increases. So the lethal dose also increases. Unfortunately, the dose needed to feel high increases even faster. So if you look at it, what happens is you need more and more to get high, but the amount you need to overdose doesn't go up as fast. So if you look at this chart, after about a month, you need a little over a thousand uh, milligrams a day to get high. Then if you've been using it continuously at around two months, now you're just under 2,000 and look at the lethal dose amount here. And then at three months, the lethal dose amount and the amount you need to get high are very close. So it only takes a little bit to push you over the edge. And unfortunately, that's when you have problems with people overdosing. Um, sedatives are also um, a drug that when abused can lead to car accidents and other accidents because they have a drastic effect on motor coordination. That's why if you look at a, you know, any kind of pills that are prescribed by a doctor for anxiety like Valium or Xanax, it says do not operate heavy machinery under the influence of these drugs because of the effect that it has on your fine motor and gross motor coordination. So many people that are on these drugs tend to have problems with driving and tend to have a lot of issues with falling because of the effect it has on coordination. All right, let's take a look at some of the things that we talked about real quick. Heroin, which class of drugs? We talked about it as a narcotic. I'm going to see similar questions to, the, to these on next week's test. A uh, category of drugs to which barbiturates belong, that would be sedatives. Whoop. That would be sedatives. And then codeine used to be in cough syrup, also a narcotic. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about another class of drugs called the stimulants. So stimulants are drugs that tend to increase central nervous system activation and behavioral activity. They include cocaine and methamphetamine and amphetamines. You could also see, you know, slight stimulant effects in caffeine and nicotine. That's usually why people drink coffee and smoke cigarettes or vape nicotine because of the stimulant effect. Cocaine is usually cons consumed as a powder that is snorted and there was a problem for a while. I'm not sure if it's still a, as big an issue with people purifying the cocaine and then smoking it. And at the time it was called crack, which is basically chips of pure cocaine that you smoke much more potent. Another, <coughs> excuse me, type of stimulant are the amphetamines that are usually taken as pills, so they're consumed orally, but some people inject the amphetamines called crank, and this is also, you know, a very, very powerful and addictive stimulant. Amphetamines and cocaine have almost indistinguishable effects, except that cocaine produces a much briefer high. Both drugs produce this sort of buoyant, elated, enthusiastic euphoria, and the other desired effects include increased alertness and increased energy. So these were the drugs of choice a lot of times by people that had to work night shifts, truck drivers that were on the road for, you know, eight, ten hours a day driving just to stay awake. 
Stimulants also can cause physical dependence and are exceptionally powerful, can have an exceptionally powerful form of psychological dependence as well. Stimulants can produce fatal overdose by causing a heart attack, a stroke, or some kind of seizures. Cocaine overdoses have increased sharply in recent years as a result of the, again, this is sort of a little bit dated, the result of the use of crack cocaine. Cocaine had been cited in 42% of drug-related deaths and amphetamine to about another 10%. Heavy use of the stimulants can also lead to gradual deterioration in physical health. If you ever look at someone that's been addicted to methamphetamine for a while, you see that they look a lot older than they really are. You know, it's, they just don't have a healthy look about them because stimulants can disrupt sleep, can suppress appetite, increase also one's risk of cardiovascular diseases and respiratory diseases. So even though the person is sort of trying to get the, the euphoric effect of the drug, there's a lot of negative side effects that come from sort of use of these drugs over a long period of time with your overall health, not just addiction and not just overdose. Okay, then we'll talk a little bit about the hallucinogens. So the principal, historically, the principal hallucinogen that was used by people was LSD or acid which was synthesized in a drug lab. And then there's mescaline, which comes from a plant called peyote, and psilocybin, which comes from a type of mushroom. All three of these are usually taken orally. And the main desired effect of the hallucinogens are feelings of euphoria, increased sensory awareness, um, altered sensory perceptions, and profound personal insights. So, you know, in the 60s and 70s, a lot of musicians used these drugs because it sort of was thought that it would help them become more creative. So the interesting thing compared to the other classes of drugs that we talked about, there really is no potential for physical dependence of the hallucinogens. Psychological dependence tends to be rare and the risk of overdosing tends to being negligible. So even though they have a very powerful effect, they don't have the kind of side effects that you see with the other drugs that we talked about, like, you know, a strong addictive quality to them. But hallucinogens are involved in about 1% of drug-related emergency room visits, mostly because some users experience acute anxiety attacks from having these really altered perceptions, and in severe cases of disorientation, accidents, and sometimes suicide is possible. All right, let's do a quick check. Click on the category of drugs to which morphine belongs. Easy one, narcotics. Click on the category of drugs to which cocaine belongs. That would be a stimulant. Click on the category of drug to which LSD belongs. That would be hallucinogen. Okay. Then we go to cannabis, which is increasingly becoming a discussion that people are having because as of today, it was on the ballot to legalize cannabis in New Jersey. So let's talk a little bit about cannabis. Cannabis comes from the hemp plant uh, from which marijuana and hashish are derived. Marijuana is a mixture of the leaves, the flowers, the stems taken from the plant, while hash comes from the resin of the plant. Cannabis can be consumed orally, you know, in edibles, but it's usually ingested by smoking or vaping now. The effects of cannabis can vary greatly from one person to the next. That's why some people swear as a swear by it in terms of it helps them deal with pain or anxiety, and other people it has the opposite effect. But usually most people um, use cannabis because of the effects of mild euphoria, relaxation, and to a degree enhancement of some sensory stimulation. Physical dependence usually is not a problem, but you can have some issues with psychological dependence in a minority of the heavy users. They feel they need it every day to function. By itself, cannabis doesn't tend, I've never heard of anybody overdosing by smoking too much pot, but it is cited as a contributing factor in about 6% of drug-related deaths, 
One reason is that marijuana has a more sort of a negative impact on driving than is widely appreciated. That's the danger here. If we legalize it, are we going to have an issue now with people on the road that are high as well as drunk? Cannabis also contributes to about 17% of drug-related emergency room visits, primarily because it can cause transient problems with anxiety and depression in some people. And like tobacco, marijuana smoke carries carcinogens and impurities into the lungs, thereby increasing one's chance for respiratory and pulmonary diseases, as well as a slight increased risk for lung cancer. So recent studies have found an association between chronic heavy marijuana use and modest impairment in attention and memory um, that lingers even after the person isn't high. For example, the research results depicted in this chart show reduced memory performance long after marijuana use has stopped. Okay, and that then ends the first lecture tonight on the effects of drugs on consciousness.